So if you were paying attention like a good little person who should subscribe to my channel, hope that was subtle enough for you, you would have noticed that I said the Farset Enclaves are pretty much the only unqualified good guys in the setting in my Tau do or don't. They don't sterilize people or anything like that, they don't really take over planets or, you know, do anything evil. Like at all. In fact, they largely just keep to themselves, like the Switzerland of Warhammer 40k. But are they still grimdark? Well, in a few days, yes, they very much are. But that's jumping the gun a little bit. Since the Tau video wasn't too long ago and is still somewhat fresh in my rapidly degrading memory, why don't we talk about these guys just a bit? After all, between the main Tau video and this one, that's like 50% of all Tau content I can possibly make. I guess I could cover Fire Warrior, but better YouTube channels than I have covered that game, and I'd rather not brick my PC covering a Halo clone with all the good things about Halo sucked out of it with a vacuum cleaner. So let's discuss Warhammer's only lawful good faction for a bit, shall we? But first... Hey you. Yeah, I know you can see me. You know how often I show my face on this channel? It's been once in a video so far. Why am I doing it again? It's because I have something very important to talk to you about today. Balls. Because this video was sponsored by Manscaped, and if you or someone you know has balls, then you're gonna want to pay attention to what I have to show you here. I'll just cut straight to the point, much like Manscaped does. Shaving down there? Risky business. If you get a cut, then you are in for a brief but intense amount of pain, and I don't know about you, but I prefer when my groin isn't in agony. Maybe I'm just weird like that, and even if you avoid that catastrophe, your crown jewels still might smell like you just ran a mile. Balls take a lot of work to maintain, turns out. Luckily for you, the Manscaped Performance Package 4.0 has your back. And your balls. First off, the Lawnmower 4.0 Body Trimmer. This thing is gentle as hell in your package. Take more word for it because I used it. I'm not gonna show you that because some things are best left out of the public eye, but I can assure you it's never been smoother in my neck of the woods. I even used it to shave my eyebrows up just a tad. Before I use it on my sack, give me some credit. There's even a 4000K light so you can see what you're doing. If you're going spelunking, it's best to be prepared after all. Of course, there's still the issue of smell, and this is where the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant as well as the Crop Reviver Ball Toner comes in. They're sulfate free and vegan, so there's no need to worry about putting harmful chemicals all over a very important place. And your boils will smell absolutely stunning. And not stunning in the make a constitution roll saving kind of way because the smell coming out of your crotch usually only comes from pig pens. Your balls are going to smell great. If you're still not convinced, the Performance Package 4.0 comes with not only the Shed Travel Bag to hold all your grooming products on the go, but a pair of Manscaped brand boxers as well. Let me assure you, my nuts have never been more comfortable in my entire life. Christmas is only a month away, fellas, and even if it's not for yourself, there's no better stocking stuffer than Manscaped. And to give you just a little bit more incentive to try out this phenomenal product, using my link in the description or the pinned comment, or by going to manscaped.com and using the code PNW20 there, you get not only free shipping, but 20% off your order. Again, free shipping, and 20% off. For that price, your balls are going to be begging you to sign up. And all ball jokes aside, these products really are great, easy and safe to use, and keeping up with hygiene is always important. And you can get these products at an absolute steal using my linker code. Get Manscaped now, and treat yourself and your nuts to a little something special. Now then, let's get on with the show. The Farsight Enclaves have their origins during the Damocles Crusade, but their founder, Commander Farsight, goes back further. He's one of those people that seem destined for greatness from the start, though often to his detriment. Showing up your instructors, for instance, is a great way to make yourself A, stand out, and B, send your career on a fast track to a dead end. Though luckily for him, he was simply too good to shove in some desk job, so he was eventually promoted to being a battlesuit... pilot? Would you call the person inside one a pilot, or do they more wear it? Oh well, semantics aside, he's always been good at what he does, though perhaps too inclined to engage in melee for the rest of the Tau commanders to be comfortable with. All this being said, he existed at the same time as one Commander Pure Tide. Commander Pure Tide was basically Tau Sun Tzu, and every battlefield he went to was pretty much a guaranteed Tau victory. So great with his strategic genius that even to this day, Tau military commanders basically just try to copy whatever he might have done in a situation, and in fact, most of them could only manage to grasp a part of his teachings. He had many pupils, the greatest of whom were Commander Shadow son, aka Tau Fanart the character, another Tau named Shazo Kais, who funnily enough is the same guy from Fire Warrior and Dawn of War, so I already know he kicks ass, and none other than Commander Farsight. These three were his best pupils, which formed a school of combat around aspects of Pure Tide's teachings. The Tau even downloaded Pure Tide's brain onto a microchip to keep it around for the future. This killed him, and Farsight was the one who had to do it. This is a great way to generate loyalty in your soldiers that surely will never come to bite you in the ass. Pure Tide even told Commander Farsight before he died to not trust them all, which translates to the ethereals are scumbags for the love of God, get out while you can. I might be paraphrasing a bit there, but that's close enough to what it meant in the end. After this, Farsight was given a massive fleet of Tau and told to go butcher some orcs, and he did so with gusto. He realized that close quarters combat is the best way to deal with orcs, which uh, I can't say I understand that one, given that pulse rifles probably obliterate orc sports is just fine from a distance, but Farsight did win in the end, so who am I to disagree with him? He also met the only cool ethereal known as On-Shi and developed a melee battle suit after talking to the guy for a bit. 
Neat. Side note that's important to mention, but I don't really know where to put it, so here it is. Shadow Sun Okai's and Farsight were all regularly cryogenically frozen to keep them, and more importantly, Pure Tide's teachings alive, since Tao don't live that long of lives, all things considered. Pure Tide's neurochip was reproduced, but putting it in someone essentially turned them into a mindless robot that can only do tactical thinking. And all of Pure Tide's wisdom was useless against Psykers because he somehow never encountered a mage in the fantasy setting that is this sci-fi setting. To get back to Farsight, he was then redeployed to deal with the Damocles Crusade. Deal with is really the only way I can put it, because the Tau, despite holding their own, were completely outnumbered in ways never before encountered. And at times, Farsight's brilliant was pretty much the only thing keeping them winning any battles. After the Crusade abruptly ended, because the Tyranids decided to make a guest appearance at what was soon to become an all-you-can-devour buffet, Farsight was taxed with reclaiming some of the world's lost and expanding where he could. Instead of narrating the entire series of events, I'm gonna mostly just give you a quick rundown of the coolest shit he did in chronological order before he decided to succeed from the Tau Empire. He floated through an Imperial gun battery on a ship so he could disable its Geller field. Lucky for him it didn't fire while he was floating through the damn thing. He manages to escape said ship as it gets filled with demons, so he's also got a lucky streak to rival Kane about him too. The territories he had reclaimed for the Tau came under siege by a massive orc Wa, so obviously it was time for him to get fighting them. I say fight, it was more like mushroom genocide. There'd be a whole lot of orcs near a volcano, so he'd make the damn thing erupt. If it was near the coastline, it was time for a surprise tsunami. He mostly ended this whole mess by punching through the orc war boss's command vehicle and vaporized him with a battlesuit-based Kamehameha. After this, the three ethereals that were assigned to his expeditionary force were getting sick of him not conquering Imperial worlds in favor of orc butchering, but he kept ignoring them to finish off the green stragglers. Eventually, they nagged him enough, and they all ended up on a planet called Arthas Moloch, which is a name that should probably hint to you what he found on there, given that the last time someone important in Warhammer went to a planet called Moloch, all four Chaos Gods collectively shat a brick. Surprise! Demons show up and cause some ruckus and grievously wound Farsight. He did find a nifty-looking sword, though, which is something, I guess. After that, it was murder time, once again. He climbed into his battle suit for what he thought would be the last time. One of the ethereals actually mentioned demons and revealed they knew all along what was going down with these weird aliens that weren't actually aliens at all, and then he went demon killing. He chucked a whole bunch of anti-chaos amulets he found into the portal that came out of to make it blow up, because whoever left the sword and these medallions just lying around clearly had some organizational issues to sort out. After this, there was only one thing left to do for him. Kill all the orcs left on the planet. The number of them remaining was higher than zero, you see, and this simply would not do. He went to work with his newfound sword, and to his surprise, Notice that when all was said and done, he had not only been healed of his wounds, but had regressed in age to his prime. Turns out he found a vampire sword, a pretty damn convenient thing to have in store. My guess is that it's one of the 99 swords that Vald made for Kane, because I simply will not, and indeed cannot, let anyone forget that I think the Eldar are the best for a single goddamn moment. Oh, and those three ethereals with him got murdered by demons. Sucks to suck, douchebags. And this is where we finally get the Farsight Enclaves proper. After all this had happened, he realized that the Tau leadership was either maliciously lying about the truce of the galaxy, ignorant, in denial, or some combination of all three things. Combine that with the fact that all of the ethereals who could stop or report him came down with a sudden case of death, he had the perfect chance to get the hell out of Dodge. So he took some of the planets he recaptured, as well as the forces under his command, and just kind of stopped being a part of the Tau Empire. For a while, the Tau figured that since they hadn't heard from him, everyone involved was dead. It had been over a century and a half. They assumed things went south and just chalked it up to a loss. What are you gonna do? Then an exploration probe visited the systems the Enclave supposedly perished in and found out that, wait a minute, they're doing just fine. And they changed the set markings and were ethereal free and, oh, they were pissed. Upon discovering that Farsight had pulled the old switcheroo on him, they did a 180 on their opinion of the guy. Statues of him were obliterated and he was either removed from history outright or rebranded to be a cowardly traitor to depending on the specifics of the records. His old peer and rival Shadow Sun even considers him as such now. I couldn't find anything on what Okais thinks of him, because presumably thinking about something like that would require not being Tau Doom Guy for more than five seconds. Of course, this didn't sit well with a lot of people, especially members of the Firecast who still viewed him as a hero. So a lot of them secretly supplied him with weapons and materials. Most of the Enclave's equipment is slightly out of date, but not enough to keep them too far behind the Tau Empire as a whole. As for why the Tau don't try to reconquer them, it's because in the meantime, Farsight turned the entire damn place into a fortress sturdy enough to make a dwarf grudgingly say that it's all right. Orbital stations and defense platforms litter the space around the Enclave, so while they might not have the manpower to truly go on the offensive, they also sure as hell aren't going to be invaded with what they're rocking back at home. It'd be like a burglar breaking into your house and you have a loaded cannon pointed at the doorway. As for what the Enclaves get up to in the lore, there's only so much to say on the matter. There was their founding, which if you haven't noticed, is also just the history of Commander Farsight himself, and then there was the time that the Enclaves were invaded by a Tyranid Splinter Fleet. Farsight had by this point gone into self 
himself in post-retirement, and when he realized things were getting as bad as they were, he just walked up to the museum his old battlesuit was held in, hopped in, grabbed his murder sword and 80 other battlesuit pilots, and went to town on the Tyranids long enough for Earthcast scientists to develop a toxin capable of ending the Tyranids for good. A side note, but if you think that's some plot armor BS, please remember that A, the Death Watch also uses toxins against the Tyranids, and B, people are allowed to do things that the Imperium can't every now and then. After this, he decided to stick around for a while, helping to lead the Enclaves alongside his seven new compatriots he handpicked to give themselves some assistance. They creatively call themselves the Eight. Now about the only thing I really know about the Eight is that there's as many of them as there are JoJo's. And as much as I'd like to sit here screaming like a brain addled moron about how Warhammer 40k is just a JoJo reference, I think it'd be best if I left these guys as someone who actually knows what he's talking about. So while I'm going to go watch an episode of Diamond is Unbreakable and fast forward, Josuke is the best JoJo by the way, I'll fight you on this, please allow me to introduce the one, the only Gaijin Goomba. That's right, someone who actually knows what they're talking about was willing to make an appearance on this garbage fire of a channel. I'm just as shocked as you are. Mr. Goomba, why don't you tell us about the eight and what makes them badass? Someone who knows what they're talking about? Bro, I come to you for Warhammer lore. But I am a giant weeb and I do love the Farsight Enclave almost as much as I love my bad moon orcs, so I'll do the best I can. So if I was to describe the eight in one word, it would be Sentai. No, I'm serious. Just as every single member of a Sentai team brings something unique, powerful, and sometimes just outright goofy to the group, the eight all have such insanely different backgrounds, skills, and weapons that... Man, let me just go down the line. You all at this point know about Farsight, and that's about as much of a literal Red Ranger as you're gonna get. But don't get me wrong, not all of the eight have insanely weird backstories. Like Archon, for example, isn't anything weird. He just has an incredibly tactful mind and was really good at developing technology to grind guardsmen to a finer pace than they usually get grinded to. But then we got Bravestorm, and if you thought Oshova was the only Tau badass enough to go in a melee, this guy was one of the first XV-8 pilots to strap on the experimental Onager gauntlets during the Damocles Crusade, as he literally just punched tanks to death until he was struck down at Black Thunder Mesa. He escaped with his life, but now is relying on his crisis suit for life support. But when you're in an iron lung with enough plasma firepower to make a Skatari blush, I don't think it's that problematic. Then we've got Commander Brightsword, a longtime friend and ally in arms of Farsight. There isn't too much to say about this guy aside from his natural ability to mulch orcs for a living, but there's an interesting side note to him. Seven other generations of commanders took his name much how other Japanese warriors would inherit their predecessor's name. Looking at you, Hattori Hanzo. Though, the fun fact here is that it wasn't seven different Tau individuals taking the name, it was seven clones of the same guy taking up the mantle. See, this is why I'll always love the Tau more than the Imperium. Tech heresy is dumb, and you're dumb if you believe in it. And speaking of tech heresy, up next is old Oblatai 9-0. Unlike the majority of the eight, Oblatai rocks a missile rack riddled robot of his very own. And I say robot, not suit, because Oblatai is technically an artificial intelligence engram unit, not flesh and blood. He's basically the Star Trek Next Generation data of the group, but with the ability to download himself from a busted broadside suit to a humble Tau drone, then re-upload himself into an advanced stealth suit. Actually, I take that back. Based on his humble and self-sacrificial nature, I think he's actually more like the Iron Giant. But they're still not the most out there member of the eight. Shavasto, saved by far sight from a state-mandated lobotomization ordered by the Ethereals, was the first to be implanted with the experimental Puritide Neurochip, basically a downloaded supplement of Farsight's teacher's brain. Yay, more tech heresy! Even for the Tau though, this one's kinda right on the edge. In fact, Shavastos had to be put in a cryosleep until someone could reconfigure the chip correctly so it didn't obliterate his brain. And the Tau responsible for that and all of the above-mentioned tentacle marvels and heresy is none other than the stone dragon himself, Ovesa. A bizarre mix of Tony Stark, Dr. Wily, and Eggman all rolled into one, just minus the megalomania and alcoholism. Plenty of eccentricity, though. Ovesa is likely the smartest scientist the Earthcast has ever seen, responsible for Bravestorm's life support XV-8, Bright Swords clones, Shavasto's Puritide chip calibration, Oblatai's everything, and finally his own life-elongating tech. And how does Ovesa keep himself alive for generations on in? Nanomachine, son. Oh, and did I mention that he pilots the group's biggest mech? An XV-104 Riptide, baby! That's like if Billy from Power Rangers had a Megazord all to himself. Finally, we have the youngest member of the eight, Sub-Commander Torchstar, the internet's greatest poster child of Taud canonically possessing tits. Though, I suggest you never say that out loud to her unless you want to catch the business end of Twin Flamers controlled by a Tau pyromaniac so hot-headed Vulcan himself would tell her to turn it down. And that about covers the eight. I hope you can understand now why they're absolutely kick-ass. And you know, it's kind of funny. They actually remind me of the Seven Samurai, Kurosawa's legendary film wherein seven different ronin who had long lost their clans are trying to find new purpose in protecting a small village from a band of samurai-turned-bandits. 
I, I don't know. It's like this theme of falling away from a militaristic government that controlled everything into dismal nothingness, only to find a new purpose of protecting the people from real threats. Ah, uh, maybe I'm just shoving in Japanese-isms that aren't really there, but either way, the eight are just so freaking cool. Thank you for lending a hand, Gaijin Gooba. Turns out it is possible to not talk completely out of your ass when you make YouTube videos. Who'd have thunk it? As for the worlds in the Enclave, there's not many, but they're cool as hell. Very sci-fi. I recommend you go and read about them because the Warhammer Wiki will do more justice to them than I ever could, but I'd like to talk about one of them, Tenekla. Tenekla is a giant transparent crystal planet that some of the Tau engineers took a good long look at and decided it would look much better as a polyhedron. So what else do they do but shear its surface into one giant, smooth, geometrically perfect shape? Legend says that anyone who goes near Near it hears a voice whisper in their ear, telling them that a new hand touches the beacon. While you're recovering from that mental flashbang, the reason I like that planet so much is because of just how unnecessary it is. There's no strategic, tactical, or industrial reason as to why they turned the planet into a giant gemstone, they just did it because they could. And you know what? Warhammer 40k is lacking in people who do things like that just because they can. Unless I'm missing something, which to be fair is not unlikely at all, it's just Trayson stealing things for his museum, for shits and possibly giggles, and this thing. I want more things that exist for no better reason than the people who did it flexing on everyone else. Now, I've mentioned by this point that I think they're just straight-up good guys, and I mean it. They don't conquer worlds, they don't genocide anyone, except orcs and tyranids, but if there's anyone worth killing, it's them, and they even allow human deserters and refugees from the Imperium to settle on one of their worlds. True, they still have the caste system, but I read that in this case more as them having people specialize fields in a way that resembles what they're already used to. Not a rigidly defined hierarchy kept in control by the Ethereals like the Tau Empire proper has. But they're still grimdark. How is that? They're grimdark by virtue of the fact that in the grand scheme of things, they're nothing. For every human life they save from the Imperium, a billion more are worked to death in some factory or thrown into a fight they can't possibly hope to win. Nothing they do will cause any of the factions, even one as small as the true Tau Empire, to seriously consider changing their doctrines. Why would they? This group of people has four systems, that's nothing. The only reason they're not invaded regularly is the same reason the rest of the Tau aren't invaded often. It'd be disproportionately difficult to take compared to what any conqueror would get out of it. I mean, which target is more worth dealing with? The people with the Meridia's beacon planet mining their own business, or the rampaging orc horde that just slaughtered an entire titan legion. They're vastly outnumbered by every other faction, even the Eldar, and are certainly outmatched by them as well. The only possible reason I can really see them getting invaded is if the Eldar want their god's toy back, assuming it actually is one of Val's old swords. They can ultimately do nothing to affect the grand setting of Warhammer 40k. Maybe, and this is a real big maybe, Farsight might launch a coup of the Tau Empire so GW can make it go back to being how it originally was before they grimdark it up a notch. But that would just put them in the situation the Tau are already in, that of being completely completely outnumbered and outmatched by everyone else. Hell, that sort of civil war might end up weakening the Tau enough for someone to come in and conquer them. In short, they're not grimdark because of what they do, they're grimdark because of what they can never do. Because of how small this bright spot is in the shithole of a galaxy the Milky Way is in the 41st millennium. And you know what? I'm glad for that fact. It makes them special. The fact they're not worth conquering means that somewhere, even in just the corner of a corner of Warhammer, people are able to have a generally good life. Even if you need to look deep to find it, there's still good people in this galaxy. Not good deep down, but forced to do evil by everything around them, or good in comparison to the literal demons they have to face, just straight up good. So there's the far side enclaves and the history of the man who created them. Hope you enjoy this brief look at the only decent people in this galaxy. And thanks to Gaijin Goomba for his insight on the aid and just generally helping me out with this. Wait, Pank, hang on a second here. Oh, what's on your mind, Chief? Something that's bothered me is that everyone I know who's even mildly interested in 40k keeps saying that the tower weebs dicks. Now, I can see that the enclave is for sure, but Tau as a whole? Bro, it's not even close. I don't know, man. They do, uh, they seem kind of weeby. Well, how about you come over with me on my channel and I'll explain the whole thing. Trust me, it's gonna blow your mind. Well, you heard it here first, folks. Unless you watched his video first, then you heard it here second, folks. He's not just making an appearance on my channel, I snuck my way into his as well. Make sure to head over to Gaijin Gooba's channel once you're done with this video. He's taking a look at the cultural parallels that the Tao have with the real world. And as you might have guessed, it might not be as Japanese as you think. And as always, thank you to my wonderful channel members. You are the vampire sword to my commander Farsight, giving me the sustenance I need to continue on another day. I assume that none of you are giving me actual blood money, but that's one of those things you probably don't want to ask now, is it? You're either making some pretty heinous assumptions about someone or getting an affirmation you are not ready for in the slightest. If you'd like to support the channel, feel free to subscribe or become a member. And of course, remember to go check out Gaijin Goomba's channel. It's a great dive into the culture you might not expect is backing a lot of characters and more from across fiction. You can even start in the Warhammer comfort zone and look at some work stuff he's made before checking out the rest of it. Thanks for watching, and take care out there.
You think that's the real secret of Farsight's sword? I didn't mention it before, but it's straight up called the Dawnblade, which is not really that far removed from Dawnbreaker. Maybe the quest that led to him starting the Farsight Enclaves was just the real Meridia's quest line. I don't know. I just know that as I'm writing this script, I'm getting flashbacks to every single time I've opened a chest or something and had my eardrums blown out. Oh wow, this is a neat chest. What am I going to find? It? A new hand touches the beacon. None other than the stone dragon himself, Ovesa. A bizarre mix of Tony Hawk... T Tony Hawk! Pay, can you find a picture of Tony Hawk and then paste Ovesa's face on it? That'd be amazing. Okay, blooper over. Ahem. 